gets cold in a hurry, don't it? We're glad you're here this morning. So thankful that the Lord's allowed us this opportunity to be in his house today. And I don't know why you're here, but I hope it's just to worship for a little while this morning. And I need to get something out of the way right off the bat. Everybody see this stain on my leg? No. My wife didn't know it was there. That's what happens when you get in fight with a peanut butter syrup waffle. <laughs> That's seven o'clock on a Sunday morning. And you look at it and you say, I got it off the best I can, but I don't want to change pants today. So I'm just going to work like it is. <laughs> so I, she, when we get home, she'll see that. And she'll say, I cannot believe you wore those pants. <laughs> so we're just going to get that out of the way right off the bat, okay? We good? <laughs> Now, well, I won't get thrown down the house when I get home. So. God's good, isn't it? Even when the preacher ain't got no sense, God's good. You know, the Bible says the foolishness of the preacher. No, I'm just kidding. But we're glad you're here this morning. I hope and trust that the Lord just, you're here waiting on a word. Something that can help you be better. You know what? That's, what, that's our whole thing. We all just want to be better. And the only way we're going to get better is to let the Lord be real in our life and be obedient to him. So this morning, let's just be obedient to him. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. Father, we thank you so much for being just a great and awesome God. Lord, we thank you for just allowing us the opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, we thank you for, Lord, this beautiful sunshine you've sent us today. Father, you know exactly what we stand in need of, and we're so thankful for that. Lord, we lift all of the ones on our prayer list up. Lord, we just pray God to work in their lives, Father. The ones we know about, Lord, and the ones we don't, Father. But I pray you just be real in their lives, Father. The ones that's lost loved ones, Lord, comfort as only you can. But, Lord, this morning, we want to be quick. We want to be quick to give you the glory for everything in our life, Lord, the good and the bad, Father, because you are an awesome God. And this morning, we ask you to anoint us from the throne this morning, Lord, and just let the praises ring to you. We love you and we thank you, Lord. This angel pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Number two.
allow us to wake up this morning and just come outside to see your beautiful world. Say, dear Lord, I pray that as we're here today, that you just touch whoever you need to be touched in the world.
never been a moment you were forgotten you're not hopeless though you have been broken your innocence stolen Remember when she used to be about this tall? I'm gonna stand up in a chair and sing. Some of us do. You know, it's amazing how God uses people and what God does with people. And uh, you know, to see her today, them two precious babies, and uh, all grown up and stuff, or think she is. <laughs> You know, that circle of life, we just, it's one thing that always blows our mind. And we don't understand it sometimes. But to see that beautiful family, to know that, it, it's, it's kind of a little bit emotional for me this morning to a certain extent. Because another lady that was instrumental in my life as a young boy growing up has been called home to be with the Lord. So, you know, when you look at those things and you think about those things, you know, you look back and you say, the memory I have uh, of being with her and her family back when we were kids, me and her son were kids. You know, that's a time of memory, not a time of present. But I'm so thankful that her future is sealed in Jesus Christ because I know where she stood with him. 
because he had rescued her. Brought her out of the darkness into the light. Boy, isn't that good? You know, this morning as we move on to that second great I am statement of Jesus, 8th chapter of John, if you'll be turning there, did you know that light is the one thing that cannot hide itself? If light is to be hidden, something has to hide it. You ever notice when the sun's out, but it's cloudy, you can't see the sun, but it's still light. Something covers that sun, but the sun still shines through. Light cannot hide itself. Isn't that good? I like that thought. Yeah, it reminds me of that little uh, kid song. This little light of mine, you know? I'm going to let it shine. I'm going to hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. What's this? Don't know that guy. You better go ahead and got a light cut out. But see, I stand here with this and all your attention. Everything when you look at me is not focused on me. It's focused on that, is it? It is. Think about it. It's focused on, you say, if something's different about him up there, and all I can see is that light on his head right now. All I can, that's all I can see. But watch this. Now you can't see that light, can you? But what happened to it? I had to hide it. When I moved my hand, that light's right back, isn't it? See, light cannot hide itself. It is revealed. So I'm going to cut all the lights out, see, and I still see my word, and you can't. Light can't hide itself. But you have to have it. It's, it, it, it's so important in the life. And it's so important in the things of God that this second great statement that Jesus makes, before you can understand the statement you got to understand the first 11 verses in front of it and the verses that are behind it. One of the most famous stories in the scripture. We love this story. Because, it, again, it's a point where, guess what? God came down and he rescued a woman that was caught right in the middle of the sin, caught right in the middle of adultery. But as only Jesus can, can I tell you something? Jesus, you got to hear this, church. you got to understand this. Jesus never fought a battle outside the Word of God. He never, ever <laughs> went into an argument, and he didn't argue, or a debate. And they always tried to trip him up. The Pharisees did everything they could to trip him up. But he always used the Word of God. What is the Word of God? It's the lamp that lights our feet. That's what Psalms teaches us. In this 8th chapter of John, Look at these first 11 verses with me. <laughs> Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And uh, uh, look at this. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman, taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted himself and saw none of the women, he said unto, none of, he said unto the woman, Where was thou thine accusers? Hath no man con condemned thee? 
She said unto him, No man, Lord. And Jesus saith unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, but look at this, go and sin no more. You see that? That's important. Nobody wants to take that word and use it today. Go and sin no more. I want to be forgiven of my sins, but I want to continue to live in my sins. It don't work that way. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Now, it's important to know that, that early in the morning, but up in that second verse, Jesus said, they're all in the temple, and it's early in the morning. How many of y'all like sunrises? You like to see the sun? I love to see the sunrise. I love to see that sun start coming up over those trees, and it just burst into its majesty. Well, see, the Jewish nation of that day, the sun was a symbol to them of Jehovah God. That was one of their symbols of Jehovah God. When that sun came up every morning, they claimed God in that sun. So that's a very important time of day. And as they came at the sunrise, as they came to this point, they brought this woman to Jesus. And listen, they're doing everything they can to trip Jesus up. They do everything they can to accuse Jesus. They're looking for one little thing that they can accuse against him so they can crucify him. So they can kill him. This goes on and on and on. We saw it. We've read it. You've looked at it. You, you've studied it. But you know what? Jesus is smart. That's an understatement, isn't it? Jesus knows the word. That's another understatement, isn't it? Because he is the word. But what Jesus does is he never jumps out there and just flies off. Listen to this. Hear me when I say this. He never jumps out there and flies off a hammer. That sounds familiar to anybody. How many times have you let the least little thing just blow you up? I mean, just send you into a frenzy when it doesn't have to. But it sends you into a frenzy. You begin to think, why am I doing this? What am I doing right here? And next thing you know, sometimes you get in such a state of frenzy that you don't even remember what happened. Why did I go off so? Why did I go so crazy? Why did I do this? Oh, that little bitty thing set me off. That little bitty thing that meant nothing to nobody set me off. That's easy for us, isn't it? So Jesus is teaching in the temple. Here come the scribes. Here come the Pharisees. And they bring this woman. Now here, this is important. you got to see this. And they bring this woman in. And listen, there's a multitude of them accusing her. There's a multitude of them saying, because the word says they. When you see that word they, that means there's more than one. That's full, cool, right? They were accusing her. They brought her in. They put her before Jesus. They said unto Jesus, what do you say about this? We know, listen, we know what Moses' law said. They know what it said. I want you to hear, this is important, because this is what Jesus does. Jesus used their own law to show them they were wrong. They came in, they said, we know what Moses' law said. Yeah, you know what Moses' law said, but you're using Moses' law out of the context of what Moses' law said back there. You know what happens when we start trying to use the Word of God out of context? We get it all messed up, and it's not going to work in our life because we begin reading it in ourselves, not for what it means, but for what we want it to mean. That's what we want to do. Now, we want to make the Word of God read the way we want it to read, say what we want it to say, so that our lives can mirror what we want God's Word to say. Because when we look at God's Word in our own life, it cuts us. It challenges us, and it changes us. So they came in and they put her down. They said, what do you say about this, master? They had to call him master because he was such a great teacher. They had no choice. What do you say about this, master? What do you say about this lady that we caught? Now, listen to this. They're, they're emphatic about this, that we caught in the very act. We caught her in her sin. How many times has Jesus just this morning caught you in your sin? Wait a minute, preacher. Don't get off me. This ain't about me. It's about that woman. No, this is about us. Not only that, how many times has Jesus caught you in the act of adultery? And you said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, no, don't even go there. How many times have you cheated on God? How many times have you cheated on him and his word and his son? How many times have you done that? See, what happens is you, you're, you're his bride. You're Jesus' bride, so when you cheat on him, you know what you're doing? You're committing spiritual adultery in your life right there. So, hey, hey, what you going to do with this cute? You 
throw it down there. When they threw this woman down, and they said, caught in the very act. And we have no idea when Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. I have no idea what he was writing. You have no idea what he was writing. The Word does not teach us what he was writing. But, you know, here's what I thought when I was reading this. You know what? I believe he might have stooped down that first time. I believe he might have wrote Deuteronomy 17.6. He might have even had to. Now, this is just Randy thought, okay? Don't run here. So, no, what Jesus, what Jesus said. It's just a thought, okay? Because Deuteronomy 17.6 speaks the law of Moses. And here's what it says. If you're going to accuse somebody before you can stone them, before you can put them to death, at least two of you have to be in total agreement to do that. There were a lot of accusers right here, but you're not hearing a lot of agreement. So he stooped in and he writes that. He said, but here's for you to be able to do that, you've got to be sinless yourself. If you're in your sin, you can't accuse somebody else of sin. So he stood back up and he says this, listen. He without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at him. You without sin, you be the one to throw the first rock. You without sin in your life here this morning, you be the one to, to throw the first rock. You know, we've been looking at judging on Wednesday night. We spent a whole Wednesday night looking at judging each other. And we'll be quick to judge one for the splinter in their eye when we've got a two before stuck out of ours. And that's not right. Jesus said that's not the way it works. But after he said those words, after he said, you without sin, you cast the first stone, he stood back down and he wrote again. And now I believe he wrote, and this is Randy thought, I believe he may have reached down there and scribbled Numbers, chapter 35, verse 30, which says, same thing as Deuteronomy 17, 6. If someone's caught in their sin, if someone's caught in and needs to be stoned, at least two of you have to be total agreement to do this. In other words, two of you have to say, throw the first rock. Throw the first rock. And here's what happens. Nobody wants to go that far. No, 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 no. I don't want that, I don't want that pile. I don't want to be piled here. I don't want their blood on my hands. Listen, I want to accuse them of their sin, but I do not want their blood on my hands. You see that? I want to go to a certain point, but I don't want to go all the way. I want to go to a certain point, but I don't want to be the one to say, throw the rock. You see that? They, they, they want to take the law, and they want to manipulate it. They want to turn it. See, you know what that is? That's Satan working in the lives of these scribes and Pharisees, because what does Satan do? Satan takes the Word of God, and he turns the Word of God to make you believe it in his fashion and his way so that it can undermine God and lead you to a false <laughs> Accusation, a false statement, a false movement, just like he did Eve in the garden. He turned God's word up on her, turned it around on her. The Pharisees are doing the same thing right here. Here's what the Moses law said, and Jesus said, no, here's what Moses law says. If you're going to read it and you're going to use it, you need to use all of it. So one by one, her accusers begin to drift out of there, didn't they? One by one, they begin to realize, I can't throw this first drop. One by one, they begin to move aside and say, I can't do this. One by one, they begin to step away after they realized what was being said right there, what Jesus had brought out right there. So when Jesus stood up again, he looked at that woman. He said, where are all the accusers? Where are the ones that were going to stone you? What happened to them? Where are they at? Is anybody here to cast the first stone? What's he say? Nobody. Not anybody. Then he looked at him and he said, Go. I sin no more. Now, don't think that the Pharisees and the scribes had gone far enough away that they could not hear Jesus, okay? 
Because they wanted, they wanted to hear every word that came out of his mouth because that's how they would find that accusation against him. So they sat here after this went through, after this moved out, and Jesus looks up then and he says this. Look at verse 12 with me. And he says, This spake Jesus again unto them. Look, he's speaking right to the Pharisees and the scribes right there. He's speaking right there to them. He's not trying to hide anything. He's not moving anything. He stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, and he lets the Word of God speak right there because he says, I am, here's that statement, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Only the Son of God can make this statement. Only Jesus Christ can make this statement right here. Why? Because the light cannot hide itself. He can't hide who he is. He cannot hide who he is. So why do we say he's the light of the world? Because, well, listen to me, Christmas coming up, isn't it? Y'all love the Christmas story, don't you? Y'all love to go over to Luke, read in that second chapter, and get all excited about the Christmas story. Do you know what John's Christmas story says? Let's read it. Let's listen, to, listen, listen to what John's Christmas story says. In just the very first few verses of the, of the book of John, look here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. You see that? He was the light. He was the light sent from heaven so that men could come out of the darkness. Men love darkness. They love to live in it. And as Jesus goes in right there, in, in, in John's Christmas story, John said the word was God and the word was with God. And by him, all things were made. Because what Jesus said, Jesus knew when he made this statement what he was saying, what was fixing to happen. Now, wait a minute. God is light. We know what, we know what that means. And the Pharisees knew what that meant because remember the sun? That's how they loved Jehovah God, and that was their symbol of God. The sun came up every day. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So what he did, he made himself and the Father one right there. And he knew when he did that, oh, you're comparing yourself to God. You're putting yourself up there equal with God. I am equal with God because I am the one that was with him before everything was made. I am the one that was with me. I go all the way back to the book of Genesis with you. In the third chapter, I mean the third verse of the first chapter of the book of Genesis, you know what it says right there? Let there be light. And light was separated from the darkness right there. And let me tell you something. Jesus was right there with him when that light and darkness was separated. When it all came about, Jesus was there. So when he looks at you and he looks at them and he says, I am the light of the world, there's no lie in that. There's all truth in that because he is the light of the world. But he knew he was going to have to back that up. He knew he was going to have to come in there. And I'm going to tell you something. Did you know you can't function without light? We've been down this road before, haven't we? Trying to walk around in the darkness. We know what happens, don't we? We stumble around, we fall around, we can't find our way. We end up tripping. I tripped over that corner a thousand times trying to walk through this church in the dark. And can I tell you something? That corner ain't moved in a thousand years. And I think every time I come through here in the dark that I know where that corner is. And I can ease up through there. And by the time I get there, I can sidestep and go right around that corner. And I trip over it every time because I cannot see it. What's going to happen if you're going to live in darkness? Let me tell you what's going to happen. You're going to trip over everything in your way because you cannot see it. In a spiritual darkness, the world sucks you in. It takes you in. You can't see the things of the world, and the things of the world will eat you alive in the darkness. Should we be afraid of the dark? Yes, we should. Because nothing's good in the dark. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Light exposes wrong, but light gives direction. If we've ever been in a world that needs direction, it's now. Right. Did you know that? This world needs some direction. Well, you know why? Because, let me tell you why. Because it's walking around in a spiritual darkness. We've got a 
government up there that's walking in such a spiritual darkness, they ain't got a clue what's best for the people of this country because all they're worried about is themselves. Because all they can see is themselves because they have been exposed because when the light shined, when the light came on, it exposed everything about them. And let me tell you what they're doing. They're doing everything they can now to turn the light off so that they can go back into the place of hiding where they've always been. If they can just get that light turned off, we can get back into the darkness where we know how we can survive. And I'm going to tell you something, but when God turns a light on, ain't no man going to turn it off. Ain't no man going to turn it off. When Jesus made this statement, I am the light of the world, he made a statement that was going to ring true, but he made a statement that he knew he was going to have to back up, okay? He was going to have to be with him because look at what they say. I am the light of life. We're going to get to that in just a minute. You hang on. But look at what the Pharisees say. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. You are not equal with God. You are not the light of the world. You are not who you say you are. Jesus answered and said unto him, Though I bear record of myself, yea, me, my record is true. For I know whence I came. I know whence I came. You see that? I know where I came. <coughs> For I know whence I came and whither I go. But you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. And yet if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I and the Father that sent me. It also is written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself. And the Father that sent me bears witness with me. Me and my Father are one. See that? Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? Jesus answered, You neither know me nor my Father. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. You don't know either one of us. You're hung out there in the darkness where you can't see because you can't see where you're at. Because you're hung without a light. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him for his hour was not yet come. Then Jesus said again unto them, I go my way and ye shall seek me and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, you cannot come. You see that? Whether I go, you cannot come. You're going to die in your sins. Because all you want to do is focus on yourself and living in the law that's been laid out there. But you know what? We're going to back up. You see what they're accusing him of right there? Jesus answered. Boy, he answered with everything he had. He said, being the Father of one, I am the true light. You can't see the light because you don't know me. You don't know my Father. You don't know anybody. Have you ever seen somebody, listen to this, that claims they know God and they know everything about God and they know the Word of God and the Word of God speaking to them? But yet their life gives absolutely no evidence of God. Or they know the law. You ever met someone that knows the law of the scripture? And they say, as long as I live under this law, I'll be fine. I don't think so. Because they can, there's not a man alive that can live up to the law. Amen. Nobody. Thank God for grace, because if it wasn't grace, we'd all be in trouble, okay? Amen. But you know what? It goes back. And this has got, you've got to get the light of life. He's trying to teach them what the light of life is right here. Did you know that every life has a purpose? Every life that comes into this world has a purpose. You say, wait a minute now. There's some evil people out there. I know. There's some fine people out there. I know. There's some good people out there. I know. There's some evil people that have saw the light and been made good people. Amen. I'm one of them. But you know what? What Jesus says right here. You got to get this. You got to get this for this to work in your life. The light of life. What is the light of life? It lights your purpose. It lights your plan. It lights your direction. And it shows your eternity. It lights your eternity. But you know what? To do that, you got to back up to another word. Look at this. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me. He that followeth me. 
Now, words make a big deal. Do you know that? Knowing what a word means make a, makes, makes a big difference, doesn't it? If I use the word follow, that means it's what I'm supposed to do, right? That means it's, this is what's been implied for me to do, and I'm supposed to follow him. Jesus called me, Matthew 4, 19, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. That means you've got to take the initiative to follow me. I'm giving you a direction, but you have to do it. Just because you use that word follow, listen to this, you got to get this, does not mean you're following him. When we're following him, we're on a constant, consistent journey with him. And we're constantly following where he leads us. Just because he says follow doesn't mean we're always following, does it? That means we fall by the wayside. We fall off this wayside. We fall by this wayside. And we lose our direction. Why? Because we can't see. Why? Because the light of life we have left. We've moved off that light of life. When it's dark and the lights go out, you're supposed to have a plan in place, right? Everybody's got that flashlight by their bed. Batteries are always charged in it, always good in it. But have you ever reached to get the flashlight, knock it off, and can't find it because it's dark? <laughs> hey, anybody been there? When life gets rough, we know we're supposed to follow, but when life gets hard, when life is rough, when the life gets too much for us sometimes, it just gets too much for us sometimes, and we're supposed to be following, we tend to stop, go our direction, leave the light, then we can't see where we're going. And you know what? Listen to this. It even goes a step further than that. I'm supposed to follow. I have to continue following him. But you know what? I've talked with people, and I've met with people, and I've listened to people that says I followed him. If you followed him and stayed true, that's good. But if you followed him and stopped, that's not good. Because that means you went to a certain point, and you gave up on the light. You gave up on the light of life. I've seen so many Christians fall by the wayside because they said, well, I followed him and it didn't do me any good. I followed him, listen to this, I followed him in the good times, but when it got bad again, I went a different direction. Or I followed him in the bad times and I cried out to him in the bad times, but when everything got good, I kind of went a different direction. I followed him when I wanted to follow him. I did not continue following him throughout my whole life. In the good times, in the bad times, in the valleys, on the mountains, it didn't matter. As a child of God, if we're going to get the things God has for us, and if we're going to see that light of life that lights up our direction, we have to continue following him through everything. We have to continue following the light. How many of y'all remember the, the story? I've heard thousands of people tell this, seems like. About the light down in Newton, you know, that run over there, run up the tree. Some of y'all been down there, ain't you? Y'all said, yep, I went to see it. Franklin. Franklin. June went. <laughs> but people would tell that story about that light, and it would fascinate other people, and they would have to go see it. Right? It was fascinating to the point they wanted to go see what that light was. Church, let me tell you something. No matter what's happening in your life, no matter what's going on in your life, if Jesus is lighting your way, there's going to be a light that shines in you that other people are going to see and they're going to want to come see it. They're going to, go, going to want to be where that light is. They're going to want to see that light. Because let me tell you something. When the light is in us, it shines through us. Jesus said,
said, he taught us we got to be salt and light in this earth. We've got to light this way. We've got to light this world. And the only way we can do that is if we continue following him. Jesus parked this in a beautiful place right here. In the scripture, this is parked in a great place because we saw, as, as Ariel saying, we saw the rescue of that woman from her sin right there. Now, Jesus never said that she was sinless. Jesus never said that the sin they accused her of was not true. But he forgave her of that sin and gave her instruction. Go and sin no more. He looked at the Pharisees. He says, I am the light of the world. You can't see me for who I am. You're looking for a Messiah, and the Messiah is standing right in front of you. Right here in front of you, the Messiah is standing. The Son of God, the one you've waited on since times of old, is standing right here. But because you know not him or know not his Father, you can't see him. Church, I want you to understand something. The Messiah is standing right before you today. He's standing right here for you to see today. He's standing right here to be real in your life today, and he wants to light your way today so that somebody else can see Christ in you. He wants to turn that light on. But our problem is, is we want to back up from that. This is this great I am statement. I am the light. The light. And nothing can hide that. Unless. hide the light of Jesus, the light of life in you is you. You're the only one that can hide that. You say, well, that one set beside me hid my light. That one set beside you didn't hide your light. You hid your own. They hid their own. But you see, as a child of God, as a child of the King, do we want that much to show? That much to show? Or that much to show? We want it all. Why? Because I want to follow the great I am. I want to be with the great I am. I am the light. And if you've got Jesus Christ living in you, guess what? You've got this. You got it. What are you going to do with it? You stood, some of you stood in the cold wind Thursday night. And let the light shine in you. It was cold. It sure was. You know what we you know what we think about when it gets cold? First thing we think about it's gonna snow. <laughs> then the lights are gonna go out. I gotta be ready for the lights to go out. I gotta be prepared for the lights to go out. Let me tell you what we've got to be, church. We've got to be prepared for the lights not to go out. We got to prepare ourselves for the light not to go out. I am the light of life. Have you sought Him out for your light of life today? Have you sought your purpose? Have you sought your plan? Have you sought what He has for you? I'm telling you, He got a job for everybody. 
He's got a ministry for everybody. He's, oh, he ain't got no ministry for me. He's got a ministry for everybody. It's how you let the light shine is how he's going to use you. Can I tell you something? He don't want half of it. He just don't want that half. He wants all. But for that to happen, there's got to be a power supply. If the batteries were dead in this little light right here, it wouldn't shine. If your batteries are dead, your light's not going to shine. If your batteries are half charged, that would be a little bit of light, but not real bright. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're following him, the light of life, your batteries will never go dead. I didn't say you wouldn't get tired. I didn't say you wouldn't get weary. I said your batteries would never go dead. That light will always shine in you. This is the same. Listen to this. The same one that made this statement is the same one we're getting ready to celebrate his birth. Just a few months, we'll celebrate the birth of the one that said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. So this morning, how bright's your light? Is it gone out? Is it non-existent? Have you got it hidden under a bushel? So that nobody can see it? Have you got it here? You know, I don't want nobody to see it. I want nobody to see my light. My light, and I ain't sharing it. I'm going to hide it. Or do you want it to shine bright? So that the name, listen, when your light shines bright, the name of Jesus is being glorified and magnified. I'm going to tell you something, church. Choir, you hear me when I say this. It's one thing to say to God be the glory. It's another thing to mean to God be the glory. The devil will say it, but don't mean it. When you say it, you better mean it. Because when your light is shining, he's getting the glory. He's getting the glory. So this morning, ask yourself, where am I at? Where's my purpose? Where's my plan? I've let some things creep in. I've let darkness creep in on me. I've let darkness creep back in on me and I can't see where I'm going. Or listen to this. You might be here this morning. You've never accepted Christ. You've never had the light turned on. You're living in darkness. Because I'm going to tell you, separate from, separated from Christ, you're living in darkness. I've never had my light turned on. I need my light turned on, preacher. I want to be able to see the purpose of my life. I want to see my life in Christ. But you know what? You've got to make that choice. You've got to decide for that. You've got to say, preacher, I, I, I want that today. I am the light of life. I am the light of life. Jesus said that. Would you stand with us this morning? 260 in the church hymnal. They come with a song. Ask yourself, is my light shining? Is it grown dim? Is it gone out? Where am I at today? I want to be with that great I am statement. I want that statement to be so real in my life. Man, I just, I just light up everywhere I go. You heard Scott Gentry say, Sunday night in revival, that he was in a place. And he met a man. And that man told him, he said, boy, you got Jesus all over you. I see Jesus in you. God never met this man. Our light ought to shine where people say, I see Jesus in your folks. Why? Because the light of life is lighting the way. So this morning, only you can make that choice. Only you can make that decision. How do they sing this morning? Holy this morning. Be alive this morning. Shine bright today.